Friends, I just started this last Sunday. I started a brand new sermon series that's called The Wedding and the War. Right on. So you guys like that? You like The Wedding and the War? I like The Wedding and the War. The whole thing about the return of King Jesus. And today, guys, I'm going to get into part two of this. Last week was called I Ain't Scared. And it's about the reality of we have a huge, um, well, we just have, we have a role and we have a responsibility in the body of Christ to constantly look to Jesus as our hope for everything. Right on. That we're not looking at whenever, whenever we study the end times, we're not studying it with dread. We're, we're not the world. We're not the devil, man. We are the bride that Jesus Christ comes back for. And we need to be people that we're constantly talking that talk, that we are looking for the glorious and for the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as a matter of fact, Jesus describes a penalty for those who are not. And we're talking about his bride who do not have their wicks ready, who, people who are not ready to go. People, he actually describes a penalty of being left out of the rapture of the church. And you know, one of the things that, that I was taught growing up is whenever Jesus describes, well, there'll be two in the field and one will be taken and another one will be left and there'll be two in a bed. I was, I was growing up to taught, that means one godly person and that means one ungodly person. One of the things I'm gonna challenge you with is the idea as we continue to get into this, I think, I think he's actually, talking about two different kinds of Christians, one that is believing and one that is looking and one that is happy about the return of the Lord Jesus Christ and one that is not. You know, faith actually qualifies you for certain kinds of things. And what's really is like, well, if you're going to go out there, if you're going to go after a healing, you're going to have to have faith in the healing. Well, I'm just going to just tell you that when it comes to the rapture of the church, if you don't want to believe in the rapture of the church, you don't have to. The Lord has a place for you that's called the tribulation, and you're going to get to serve Jesus all the way through the tribulation. And you know what? Uh, it, the glory of God is going to be with you, and it's going to be great. And you're going to wait on the war. That's what you're going to wait on. But there's some of us that are going to be a part of the wedding, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, there is a lot of confusion when it comes to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's, there's a lot of confusion. And I want to tell you that you need to have a certain kind of humility Whenever you, whenever you look at the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, you just need to have a very real kind of humility because, because it's, it's the same way the second time as it was the first time and that it's not that there's not enough written about it, it's that there is so much written about it. You can know some of this and you can know some of that, but you won't know some of this, right? And so it's not that you know, the Bible doesn't say enough about the end times. As a matter of fact, if you're going to read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, if you're going to check out the Gospels that reveal the first appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to go through 89 chapters. There's 89 chapters in the four Gospels, right, that reveal the first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. But friends, there are over 150 chapters that's about the return of the Lord Jesus. That's crazy. We're talking about 150 chapters. We're talking about, we're talking about nearly twice as much written about the second coming of Jesus and the narrative that we need to understand as what was written about the first coming of Jesus and the narrative of what they needed to understand. And there was a penalty for those who missed their day of visitation the first time. And there will also be a penalty for those who missed their day of visitation the second time. And friends, the reason why, again, that there was, there was confusion on the, on the first appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ, even though Daniel actually gave the time frame, <laughs> Even though he actually said, this is how many years, and it's going to be within this very certain narrow window of time. And of course, the appearance and the timing of Jesus actually showed up according to the prophecy that Brother Daniel actually spelled out. But the reason that there was a lot of confusion is because one part of the Bible said that he was going to be called a Nazarene. Another part of the Bible says that he was going to come up out of Egypt. Another part of the Bible said that he was going to be born in Bethlehem. And again, it was, it was not that there was not enough written. It was that there was so much written and much of it seemed to actually contradict itself. He said, well, there's a contradiction. So there became those who rose up and those who said, I found a verse and our denomination says Jesus is going to be called a Nazarene. And then there was another denomination of Jews that said, you know what? We found this verse and we believe that he's going to be, he's going to come out of Bethlehem. Then they found another verse and another denomination. Man, they drew their line in the sand and they said, you know what? The Bible says clearly that the Messiah is going to come out of Egypt. So he is. What they didn't understand is that the answer to all of that was Yes that Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem, they fled to Egypt, they came out of Egypt when he was about 12 years old, and then he grew up in Nazareth. 
He fulfilled it. And nobody could predict or understand exactly how all those details happened. And so exactly like that, nobody can, nobody can predict exactly how all the details are going are gonna to be fulfilled when it comes to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. But if you're going to be like, well, it seems to me that there's part of the Bible says this about the return, and then and there's this other. Listen, it is not, it's not a contradiction. It's a paradox. Okay? It's not a contradiction. It is a paradox. It does not mean that the Bible is contradicting itself. It actually means that only God Almighty is able to pull it off. And I promise you that God Almighty is able to pull this off. He did it the first time, and he's going to do it again. What I'd like to start off teaching on today is the dual nature of the wedding and the war. Even the, even the actual title itself, the wedding and the war, is very intentional on my part because when it comes to the great and terrible day of the Lord, it is both great and terrible. Yeah, it really truly really is. It's not just great. It's not just, woo-woo, Jesus is coming back. No, it's the glory of God in the midst of all kinds of hell breaking loose. Amen. And it's not just terrible. Oh, judgment, horror fest, uh, y'all that. No, no, no. It's the glory of God in the midst of that. It is both the wedding and the war. It is both the great and the terrible day of the Lord. And I'm going to end up spending a whole Sunday just talking about how the prophet Joel describes the return of the Lord Jesus as the great and terrible day of the Lord. It's, it's the narrative and it's the main theme of the book of, of Joel. But then there's also... Another, another dual nature of the return of the Lord Jesus is the catching away of the saints and the great return of the king. So the term catching away is where we actually get the word rapture from, okay? That in Greek, it's actually one of the interesting things that people say to me is, well, you know the word rapture is not in the Bible anywhere. Well, not in English, knucklehead, right on, not in English, but rapturo is definitely within the Bible, and it's, it's translated as the catching away. And there is this, it seems like there's some places where it says, every eye shall see him. And he comes back with a mighty shout and with a trumpet blast. But then there's another part of the Bible that says he shows up like a thief in the night and he catches away people. What is it? It's yes, it's both. It's both. So again, you've got this dual nature of the secret and the incredible secret thing that God, that, the, the mystery of the rapture of of, of the body of Jesus Christ and the catching away of the church and where you're caught away and the whole world is like, what just happened? We had no idea that was going to happen. We didn't see that coming. And that's that whole thing of, man, you better be watchful. You'll miss it if you're not watchful, right? But the other one, it doesn't matter if you're watchful or not. Jesus is coming back. And when he shows up, guys, the Bible describes the, the sky and it says, and the heavens roll back like a scroll and Jesus Christ is revealed, and he comes back screaming like a dadgum Comanche Indian. He comes back screaming and hollering. The Bible says, in that case, every eye shall see him. So what are we talking about? Is it this? Is it that? Is it this way? Is it that way? Is it tomato? Is it tomato? It's yes. It's both, depending upon where you are at in the midst of it. So there is one of the big reasons that there's a lot of confusion concerning the return of Jesus is simply because it's dual. There's a lot of this and that going on at the same exact time. And friends, if you're like, well, I'm sorry, I just can't keep up with that. Well, that's the way it is with your life right now. That's the way that it is. It's, it's, you got, you know, it's the best of worlds and it's the worst of worlds. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a tale of two cities called Troy. <laughs> All right? It's the best of times and the worst of times. Man, I've never fought such monster obstacles and I've never seen God show up the way that he's showing. Okay, well, welcome to the Christian world. That's, that's how we walk in Christianity. So listen, we're not going to say... Whenever it, comes, whenever it comes to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, I don't know. It, it seems like that there's a great end time revival, but it also seems like all hell's breaking loose. Yes, you're starting to get it. You're starting to get it. Like, well, I don't think I like that too bad. See, one of the things that we're going we're, we're gonna to end up talking about this whole dual thing, the reason why God is so adamant that we understand that there is a wedding and a war. There is a rapture and a return, right on. There is the thief in the night, and there is every eye shall see him. Why is that? Because the reason, there are, the reason that there is a dual nature is because there's actually a choice. There's a choice that we have to make. Now, if there's judgment and reward, and judgment and reward is always based upon a choice. That's why there are two trees in the garden. That's why. Because if God Almighty is going to reward you, he has to give you a choice. Amen. So, so if, if the Bible goes way out of its way, 150 chapters at least 
of trying to speak into these last days and speak into the end time church. If the Bible is going that far out of the way to do such a thing, then we need to understand the reason why he's saying there's this and that, there is this and there's that, is because he's saying you have a choice. You have a responsibility to make a choice. And my friends, to choose not to choose is to choose. Mm. The reason why there are rewards and judgments is because there's a very real responsibility of choice that you and I have to make. And that's something that we need to decide right now, that when it comes to partnering with God, when it comes to victorious kingdom living, and when it comes to living in the last days and being part of the end time church and believing in the glorious and the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we have to make a solid choice to decide where it is that we stand. Are we going to stand in the narrative of the world concerning the world, or are we going to stand in the biblical narrative that God Almighty gives us so that we will not be deceived? We have some very real choices. I, tell the person next to you, tell them, say, tell them, say, I ain't going to be deceived. Tell them that. Yeah, you're not going to be deceived. Guys, whenever we start talking about the end times and the condition of the world right before Jesus comes back, we tend to see that so much is written about a big, 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 terrible mess that is happening within the world, describing the condition of the world. And we don't like that. People don't like that, especially if you're somebody like me, man, and you're just all about hope and you are a hope fanatic and you're all about the goodness of God. You're like, man, I don't, I, you know, you know. I don't, I, don't, I don't want to read that sometimes, and I don't want to think about that. It's just like uh, whenever I read the story of Samson. I love reading the story of Samson, and then I don't want to read the part where he gets his eyes poked out. I don't want to read that part. I'm like, man, I, I hate reading this part. I, I want to read about the exploits of David, and, and I, I don't want to read the part where he felt so miserably. Okay, well, that's, that's humanity, and that's human nature. But what's real is if... If you think you're going to dodge the bad parts, you're wrong. Nobody dodges the bad stuff. Nobody does. Like, I will. I'm a Christian. Uh, no, you won't. Well, I don't like that. And I'm not going to go to a church that tells me everything isn't going to be perfect all the time. Everything is going to be perfect all the time once Jesus shows up. But until Jesus shows up, you've got a mess to deal with. And to act like, okay, I can pretend like that's not going to happen is ridiculous. Listen, we're supposed to walk in spirit and in truth. Amen. The Bible says, let not mercy and truth depart from you. That we're supposed to walk in this, yes, mercy. Yes, 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 yes. But yes, truth. Yes, 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 yes. Daniel described a vision of the end times, and he described it as a hurricane. And Daniel spoke saying, and I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirred up by the great sea, and the four great beasts came out from the sea. He had a prophetic vision, and he used prophetic language to, to describe something that you and I would call in our modern day vernacular, the perfect storm. You know, the Bible describes it as a, temp, as, a, as a temptus, but you and I would say it's the perfect storm. What is it? It's not just economic failure. It's failure of the nations. It's not just failure of the nations. It's the environment loses its mind. It's not just that, but the occult takes over the whole world. It's not just that. It's a perfect storm of a whole bunch of things that happen. And the only answer and the only hope in that day is that Jesus himself will return. There is no other hope. And, and see, we should already be conditioned right now and say this, my hope is in the Lord. Yeah, do I want to get insurance? Yes, of course I want to get insurance. But my hope is not in insurance. <laughs> my hope is within the Lord Jesus Christ. Right on. Uh, am I going to put on my seatbelt? Yes, I'm going to put on my seatbelt. Most of the time. <laughs> okay, but my hope is in the Lord. Amen. I can go through, you know, all the stuff, you know, am I going to be prepared? Yes, I'm going to be prepared. Am I going to do my due diligence? Yes. Am I going to try and be smart about things? Yes. But know this, man, my hope is in the Lord. And that's a, that's a condition that we should already be living in. So just like a hurricane, a perfect storm from everything global, the four beasts from the north, the south, the east, and the west, right, that they get together and everything is stirred up. So when the Bible describes the condition of the world in the last days, the Bible is actually describing a progressive intensity of everything. There's this progressive intensity. 
okay? Whereas earthquakes used to be this, now they're becoming this, they're going to become that, and then they become this, right? Socialism started off like this, and then it becomes this, and then it becomes that, and then it becomes that. Whether it's socialism or communism, the only difference between socialism and communism is in socialism, you're tricked into it, and communism, you're forced into it. But, it, but it's the same spirit, and its father is Judas Iscariot, and if you've ever heard me preach on that, you know what I'm talking about. I always say this, that the difference between socialism and communism is the difference between suicide and murder. That's what it is. And so it's the same murderous spirit is exactly what that is. Oh, wow, that was subtle as a meat cleaver, wasn't it? You like that? Thank you. Okay. So the Bible describes this progressive intensity of how things are going to go, okay? Well, Part of that is the principle of accelerated time frames. And you need to know, and I need to know, that in these last days, we live in a time of accelerated increase. Okay? And that's not all bad news. Now, it's bad news as far as the environment is concerned. It's bad news as far as the United Nations is concerned, as if they're going to solve any problem. <laughs> promise you. <laughs> I promise you. The solution is not going to come out of the United Nations. It's sure not. Um, it's, you know, we could talk, we could go on and on and on that there's this increased intensity or this, there's this accelerated development of things. Okay, well, exactly like that, exactly like that in the, in the spirit and for the people of God, we are also living in accelerated time frames. What used to take you 20 years to get, you can walk in now in a year. What used to take a whole year to work out, you can get worked out in a day now. So, so whenever I'm talking about when the Bible describes in the last days and at the end times, there's this increased intensity of everything. And like, we don't like that. No, you need to love that. Why? Because of the principle of what I call abounding grace. Where sin does abound, grace does much more abound. That's what the Bible says, right? Okay, so abounding means growing in abundant supply. Okay, I want you guys to say that with me. Growing in abundant supply. Right on. So that's exactly what abounding means. So where sin is growing in abundant supply, the grace of God is growing in abundant supply all the more. Okay, so you actually qualify for a tremendous breakthrough of the power of God dependent upon the size of the giant you have to face. Well, if the end time church is facing the most difficult time that the world has ever seen, God Almighty is pouring out his grace in a way that is more than Acts chapter 2 for the end time church. The latter rain, the Bible describes, is greater than the former rain. And that's the day that you and I live in. So I want to tell you, when I look around and say, dang, man, just looks like, you know, it looks like a, 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 a it looks like to me that just all hell's breaking loose. I go, oh, guys, look, look at the intensity. Look at how fast hell is trying to move upon us. Boom, I received the grace to overcome that. It qualifies me for something incredible, okay? I just did a real quick Google search, and I found at least eight verses in the New Testament that clearly state the principle of abounding grace. So seven from Paul and one from James. Romans 5.15, 5.17, 5.20, and so on. So you have a grace for the hell that you are fighting in your life right now, but you even have a greater grace for the hell that you're fighting in the days to come. We do not get the option not to fight hell. It's not the good Prozac of faith. It's the good fight of faith. It's not the good celebrity cruise of faith. It is the good battleship of faith. It's the good fight of faith. And, and, and you, if you think that you're going to get out of the fight because you avoid what the Bible says about the end times, you're crazy. And as a matter of fact, the only narrative and the only understanding that you're going to have of the end times, if you do not understand the biblical narrative of the end times, is the world's version of what's happening and why it's happening, and then you will be deceived. Oh, I'm about to get off into that. You know, what's real also, too, is this, friends, you don't need the Bible to tell you that sickness is increasing, that natural disasters are increasing, that racial and social unrest is increasing, that global unrest is increasing and producing unanswerable troubles and conflicts. You just watch the news. You don't need the Bible to do that. You can't be, why would you be scared that whenever the Bible says that this is gonna happen when the news says it's already happening? It's ridiculous. Guys, 
I, I'm just going to jump on a, on a dadgum soapbox here, and I know that this is going to make somebody mad, but I'm just going to just tell you that within a very short amount of time, and as recent as just a few months, the abortionist movement within the United States of America has gone from early-term abortion to late-term abortion to you can still murder a child during actual childbirth to now it's a legitimate conversation to say once the child is born, we still need to decide if it's okay with the mom if the child, if the child remains alive. And we're going to call that reproductive rights. We're also going to call that reproductive health because we care for people. That's what socialists always do. And it's like, my God, in just such a short time frame, it went from this to that. Like, whoa, what just happened? Well, what just happened is the whole thing of abounding, that there's this increased intensity that the Bible describes would actually happen but right before the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, you're in that day. You're in that day. It's true that Isaiah the prophet described this in Isaiah 520 when he said, what are those who call evil good? And what are those who call good evil? What are those who call the murder of children reproductive health? Okay, but what's real is um, you, you can avoid it in the Bible if you want to, but you can't avoid it in the day that you're living in. So if you're saying, listen, dude, I'm really not into the whole end times thing. I'm gonna say this, you're already in the end times thing. Hallelujah. So there's no, again, if, if you avoid what the Word of God says about it, you're going to fall into a big time problem because the Bible does not say, therefore thou shalt try and avoid the hell that cometh upon thee. No, it says this in Matthew 24, verse 13, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. And so, man, we need to get loaded up. Guys, I'm going I'm to keep this message positive, okay? It's very important that I keep this message positive, but I want to keep the message accurate. <laughs> okay? And that's a big deal to me. Keep it positive, but keep it accurate. Keep it positive. Yes, yes, yes. The sky's not falling. The kingdom is coming. But keep it accurate. Do not be telling people, oh, listen, because of the goodness of God, no hell is going to break loose. Because those people, if they believe that, they will become offended at God, and they will say that God has failed them when all hell does break loose. Man, keep it positive. But keep it accurate. Matthew 24, verse 12 says that in the last days, that because lawlessness will be increased, there's that exponential increase, right? That the love of many will grow cold. A lot of people are going to fall out. There's going to be a tremendous revival that's going to take place. I'm believing a billion people are going to get saved. I am. I'm believing. I'm, I'm going for a billion people. But I want to tell you that at the same exact time that we're having the wedding, we're also having the war, and there is a great falling out that's also going, going, going to take place. Why? Because Jesus does not jump through their denominational hoops. And folk get upset. You know, the whole thing of, hey, you know, keep it, keep it positive, but keep it accurate. That's how we should live our life. That's not just something concerning the last days. That's not just some, something concerning the end times. That is actually concerning our life right here, right now. That listen, I'm going to keep it positive, but I'm going to keep it accurate. Like, well, what does that mean? It's like, I'm believing in a Psalms 91 hedge protection, and I'm going to go ahead and carry if I have the right to do that. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, yes. Listen, I'm going to keep it positive, but I'm going to keep it accurate. That's what it is that I'm going to do. Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to believe to see the goodness of God in the land of the living. I'm also going to understand sometimes I'm going to fail. And sometimes the plans that I'm trying to carry out, they just don't work. And sometimes all hell breaks loose. And sometimes you get so disappointed with things. And what you don't want to do in that moment is be so unschooled in the narrative of the Word of God that you, find that, that you think that God has failed you because you were promised this eternal bed of roses while you were still on this planet Earth. That's just not true. And, it, and it's just not real, and it's just not going to happen. So we need to know what the truth of the Word of God says about the great and the terrible day of the Lord and about the wedding and the war, the return of the Lord Jesus, because the narrative matters. You need to know what the biblical narrative is. Do not avoid what the Bible says concerning the last days. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 4, he describes this falling out. And guys, I want to just, just tell you this. When, when Jesus was describing the, the destruction of the temple, his Jewish friends thought that he was describing the end of the planet Earth because they could not imagine a world where the temple was not involved. So whenever Jesus described the destruction of the temple that happened in 70 AD, um, they asked, so when, when, when is the end of the world? And I can just see Jesus just sitting there looking at them going, you know, I'm not even going to go into this. You, you do realize there's going to be 2,000 years 
at least 2,000 years. Is gonna, I mean, he just goes, okay, I'll, let, let me speak to you concerning the end of the world. Knowing that this is going to be pinned down. Knowing that this is going to be the Bible. Knowing that this was going to be preached at Open Door Church in Burleson, Texas in the year 2019. He said this, see that nobody deceives you. He's like, okay, let me tell you what. He doesn't say, be careful, don't live by the ocean because tsunamis are going to happen. He's like, yeah, there's that, but that's not really what you need to worry about. Be careful that you don't live on mountains because volcanoes are going to erupt. Now, nah, yeah, there is that, but, but you know, that's, that's really not what you need to worry about. What Jesus says is the greatest threat to the end time church is not all the hell that's happening within the world. It's deception. And what I find is people who do not know what the, exactly what the Bible says concerning the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, they avoid it because they're hoping that they will avoid hell, and they're, they're hoping that they will avoid trouble. And what's real is that makes them a candidate for the deception of the last days. I'm like, dude, I'm telling you right now, Jesus said, if you're going to worry about anything concerning the, last, uh, concerning the last days, I wouldn't be worried about your finances. I wouldn't be worried about what you're going to eat. I wouldn't be worried about how you're going to protect yourself. I wouldn't be worried about any of those things. I'd be worried about this. I will not be deceived. The biggest threat is not tsunamis. The biggest threat is not hell between the nations and hell between the races. Those are threats, and those things are real. But the biggest threat to you and to me and to my family and to my grandbabies and my grandbabies' babies, should, should the Lord tarry, is this age of deception where Jesus says this, because of the increase of lawlessness, the love of many will go cold. Okay, the increase of lawlessness literally means because of the increase of a non-kingdom social structure. Okay, the law is the word of God and it's the counsel of God. It's a, it's a kingdom narrative because you can't find anybody talking or thinking like kingdom people. The love of many will wax cold. In other words, man, it's going to be so easy to be caught up in something that is so not God that you can literally fall out and fall away. In 2 Thessalonians Chapter two, uh, chapter 2, verse 3, he says, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. So at the same exact time, while the prophets of old describe the greatest outpouring of the Holy Spirit that the world has ever seen, the greatest revival that has ever seen, there arises a politically correct kind of Christianity within Christianity that is not Christianity. I don't think that these people are falling out saying I'm no longer a Christian. I'm saying that they're saying we're homosexuals and we are also Christians. I'm saying that they're saying, hey, we're, we're okay with a globalist leader, but we're also going to call ourselves Christians. Hey, we're okay in believing in many other gods, but we're going to call ourselves Christians. The falling away is a Christianity that has fallen away from Jesus. That's what I think it is. And so I, I, think that, I think that whenever we, whenever we see this, this great falling away, and, and by the way, there's going to be a polarization within the body of Christ. Just like there's a huge polarization right now between the blues and the reds politically within, within the United States. That, that is nothing compared to what's going to happen within the body of Christ of those people who say, listen, listen, we are standing with Jesus and the biblical Jesus and those other people that say, no, we're Christians, we admire Jesus, but we have a new form of Christianity. We embrace all religions, we embrace all lifestyles, we are going to live however we're going to live. And you know what? The mark of the beast is going to be perfect for those kinds of people. Perfect for those kinds of people. And so there, at the same time that there is going to be a great end-time revival, there will also be a great end-time falling away as, as the Spirit of God moves to the church. There's going to be a large part of the, of, of the common church throughout the world that will move away from the Holy Spirit and move towards the demonic nature of the Antichrist and, actually, and absolutely sign up for it. And that's why Jesus said, man, you, if I was you, I wouldn't worry about this, 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 this. This is what I would be concerned about. Do not be deceived. Wow. I can so see it. Mark chapter 13, verse 22. For false Christs and false prophets will arise to do signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. We're talking about people in the body of Christ, in the name of Jesus, will be leading people astray. That's what it is we're talking about. Wow. 
Okay, so I'm going to close here by reminding you that there are 89 chapters in the four Gospels. 89 chapters in the four Gospels. But there are at least 150 chapters throughout all 66 books of the Bible that are describing the end times. And this is what I'm going to tell you. If you do not know the biblical narrative, if you don't, you will be open to deception. And the, the, the thing that, that I think is very important that I get across to you is you don't just... You don't just say, okay, you know what? There's going to be a great big revival and everything's going to be amazing and the power of God is going to be poured out without reminding everybody. And by the way, there's going to be more hell than you've ever imagined before because that's the way that the world is going. And you do not also say, you know what? There's hell and there's judgment and there's all kinds of stuff coming without saying, hey, the greatest end time revival you've ever seen in the power of the Holy Ghost where people are walking in the power of God like you've ever said. See, we have to have, the, this narrative is a dual narrative. And if we say both sides of the story, we also say, but you have a choice. You have a choice on which side of the fence that you're going to be on that thing. And if we do not offer both sides of that, we're taking away the choice, and those people will be carried away by the deception of this world. Oh. Learn who Jesus is. Read the red letters. Find out who God is to you. Learn your identity in Christ Jesus. Find out who you are to God. Put on the mind of Christ, as Colossians chapter 3, verse 2 of 1 Corinthians 2, 16 says. Put on the helmet of salvation, as Ephesians chapter 6 describes. And learn <clears throat> the biblical narrative of the end times. I, I only have about a minute and a half left, and I'm just going to tell you that 30 years ago, the first year that I was married, I had a, I had a vision and you got, when you guys come to the Dreams and Encounters conference that we're having here a couple of months from now, I'm going to be talking about a lot of the dreams and encounters that I have personally had and what qualifies you for that and how can you go after dreams and encounters. We're actually going to do this. Well, 30 years ago, I was, uh, was in bed, went to sleep, and I had this dream. The dream that I had was um, <clears throat> as a 19-year-old man, young man, I, I was... I was working at this warehouse off of I-35, and I was, I was a drop-dead, sold-out Jesus freak. I can't tell you how in love I was with Jesus, and I mean, I was. And I worked, and I had a very good witness, and I had a very, very, very good reputation there. Now I was a knucklehead boy, and, you know, I was one of the guys, but, I mean, everybody was like, man, Troy is like a different kind of Jesus freak, and I was. And it's in that environment and in the context of that that I tell you that I, I went to sleep and I had this dream. The dream was that I was at work at the warehouse where I was at. And while everybody else was wearing a common work helmet, you know, a hard hat, I was wearing this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful golden, golden helmet. And everybody was like, dude, dude, your helmet is so different. Your helmet's so different. I'm like, yeah, man. And I kept telling everybody, the Lord gave me this helmet. The Lord gave me this helmet. And it was my helmet of salvation is what it was. And so I checked out. It was time for me to go home. And as I walked out into the parking lot, at the other side of the parking lot was this giant wooden post that went up maybe 30, 40, 100 stories up in the air. I don't know how high. And it went up and tethered to it by a leather cord was this fierce, horrible, demonic eagle that had steel talons. And it was circling. It was flying. And I heard it scream. And I looked up. And it just starts nosediving me. And I'm just standing there completely unafraid. And it nosedives me. And then it gets to the end of the tether and just like, you know, a cartoon of Tom and Jerry, gank, and it just, whoa, and he couldn't go any further. And it was just right in front of me and it was trying so hard to get me and it was going snap, snap, snap with these talons. And I was just like, back off, you devil from hell. You better back off. Get out of my face. Who do you think you are? And then he had to back up and it was like something was pulling his rope back and he had less and less and less of this leather thing that, that he was bound to. And so I walked all the way out to the car and I kept telling him, shut up, quit making any noise. You know, quit threatening me. You have no threat over me. Stop that. And he just kept on. And I, got, I started getting this so frustrated with dealing with this devil. I, I was getting so frustrated with it. And finally, I just got full-blown mad. And I took off my helmet and I threw it at it. And I hit him with it. Boom. And when I did, all this slack fell in his cord. And he jumped on me. And right as those talons went into my face, I woke up. And I, I woke up and said, Leanna, listen, I got to tell you what I just dreamed. I was like, I don't, I don't know what this means. I, I don't know. I don't know. And she's like, Troy, 
you do not give up the mind of Christ when you battle. You will never win a battle without the mind of Christ. You do not fight for victory, you fight from victory. You don't throw away your salvation because you're frustrated <laughs> with the things that this world has given you. You don't do that, you don't fall out. If you're gonna fight and if you're gonna do real spiritual warfare, it's gonna be with the mind of Jesus Christ and seeing this the way that the kingdom narrative says that you have to see it. 